Hi everyone, I'm Shelly and you're watching There's No Place Like Home. I'm back with another question the narrative video and today's topic is portals, fairy forts, and cosmic mountains. I have been at this all day and I, what I have found barely scratches the surface, but I still have a ton of information to share with you today. I'm hoping to get through all of it. I don't know at this point how long it's going to take, but here we go. So I usually have something that causes me to want to look into something. And the tipping point for this was me watching more shows about Skinwalker Ranch. And if you haven't watched anything about Skinwalker Ranch, I suggest you do because it is really, really fascinating. There are so many things that happen there that just can't be explained. But I'm going to focus on just a couple of those things now. And the whole video is not going to be about this, but this is really how I got interested in this. Well, more interested in it because I was already um, to start with. So first of all, Skinwalker Ranch is in Utah. And it is just an area where there are sightings of UFOs. There are um, witnesses that have seen these UFOs disappear into portals. There have been technological imaging um, programs done of the entire area that have shown anomalies in the air that look like portals. And they're constantly trying to figure out what it is that it is that is causing all of these issues, all of these quote paranormal issues at Skinwalker Ranch. And one thing that I'm always drawn to, because you know how I am about, you know, mountains and rocks and stuff like that. I'm always looking at Skinwalker Ridge here and they don't ever seem to notice it. But to me, this definitely seems like it was some sort of structure that has fallen down. They just call it the Mesa or the Ridge. But as you can see here, let's see, oh, that's too much. I'll go back again. As you can see right here, it definitely looks like there was something there. And if you even go in closer to some of the shots, it, it really does look like gigantic blocks. And so all this time I've been trying to figure out what it is that it could possibly have been, what sort of structure and it dawned on me recently that it very well could have once been a pyramid. And I don't know what may have happened there. This certainly to me looks like it was melted. But if you take a look around at Skinwalker Ranch, particularly the ridge, well, first of all, this to me is reminiscent not only of other pyramids, but it really does remind me also of the Grand Canyon. Now, obviously, the Grand Canyon is on a much grander scale, no pun intended, but I think you get the idea when you see what the formations look like here certainly do look to like pyramids. I don't know, especially if they are, but it does have very much in common with what you see at Skinwalker Ranch. So I have here Skinwalker Ranch pulled up on Google Earth. And what you will see right here, I have marked as the triangle. And this is an area where a lot of the strange anomalies happen. And they claim that I, I believe it was around here where there was some sort of portal about 3,000 feet up in the air that they have been able to um, collect some sort of evidence of. Now up here on the Mesa, I wish you could see it here, you really cannot, but it is even marked Sacred Stone Circle from the Navajos. And unfortunately, you don't see much here. You can just see a few of the of the stones, but it is for all intents and purposes, a fairy fort. At least that's what we would call a fairy fort or what I would call a fairy fort. So a fairy fort is just a circle of stones. Some of them are much more elaborate than others. And the one at Skinwalker Ranch is very, very primitive. And I don't know if that is how it was originally built or if it may have just been scattered because as you can tell from looking at the photos something catastrophic happened there but there is definitely a similarity between the fairy forts which do have a connection 
two portals and what they call the stone circle, I believe, from the Navajo at, let's see, yes, the sacred stone circle. Now, again, I would really wish you could see, and I, I checked and checked for images of it, and you, I just cannot find images of it anywhere. But there is a stone circle here, and then there is some sort of a stone that has a hole through it. And if you peer through that hole, those, those portal enigmas, maybe, that, that we could call them, that showed up on one of the images, that they, uh, 3D images that they made of the ranch, well, there is a straight line from one of the, quote, portals through this hole in this rock at this stone circle, and then the other portal is here. So to me, that, that shouts pyramid because pyramids and portals are extremely interconnected. And I mentioned before how this reminds me of the Grand Canyon. And of course, we have to remember the Grand Canyon's connection to ancient Egypt, which of course, mainstream archaeology will tell you there is no connection. But I think that most of us know that there is some sort of connection between ancient Egypt and the Grand Canyon. And to me, they're all interconnected. And that's really been my jumping off point for this. And since the Great Pyramid seems to be the most well-known of these structures, we're just going to start there. And I wanted to point out, first of all, that I'm going to be extracting, or I should say sharing with you, a lot of the information from Steve Quayle's book, Unearthing the Lost World of the Cloud Eaters, and also from Timothy Alberino's book, Birthright. I'm, I'm also going to be sharing a little bit about from the book, The Genesis 6 Conspiracy by Gary Wayne. And I will leave links for all of these books in the description box. They're all fascinating reads. But first, I'm going to read to you a bit about the Great Pyramid from Steve Quayle's Unearthing the Lost World of the Cloud Eaters. Dialing the star fields back. Oh, I have to point out, unfortunately, both Steve Quayle and Timothy Alberino come at everything from a heliocentric perspective. So I kind of try to filter out what good information I can and like throw out the rest. You know, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak. So just bear with me as I read through some of this. And I do have to point out, though, that when he's talking about the constellations and everything, that's not necessarily, you know, we don't necessarily have to throw that out because the constellations are obviously there. The stars are just not what we've been told. But anyway, let's just go back to what I was going to read. Dialing the star fields back thousands of years, Boval and Hancock, yes, Graham Hancock, and again, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, were able to find an amazing match in 10,500 BC. Whilst the pyramids matched Orion's belt, the Sphinx was looking directly at, at the constellation of Leo. As such, one can surmise that this star chart alignment correlates to the pyramid's construction. Otherwise, such a construction would be totally arbitrary. If one believes the Bible's account of man's creation was 10,000 BC on the outside, and again, that's, yeah, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. It appears simply by the star charts that the pyramids of Giza were not built by the Egyptians at all. And if they didn't build them, who did? And then he goes on to say, to further muddy the waters, there is a correlation between sorry, these Egyptian monuments, I lost, lost my place, and those found throughout the Grand Canyon. So, again, it's very, very possible that these Egyptians were not built, I'm oh, sorry, not these Egyptians, that these pyramids were not built by the Egyptians at all. And the question is, who did build them then? And let's just learn a little bit more about the Grand Canyon and its connection. More baffling is the fact that the Grand Canyon's monuments are aligned with the constellation Orion, just as their Egyptian converses across the world do. Those structures are, and again, these are the structures in the Grand Canyon, the Tower of Set Horus Temple, the Tower of Ra Osiris Temple, the Isis Temple, and the Cheops Pyramid. So, pardon me, they're the Egyptian um, structures. Anyway. Archaeon cryptographer Carl Monk began to study cartographic patterns after retiring from the military in the late 1970s. He eventually developed the code, which outlines a pattern 
that he believes ancients used for positioning their structures in alignment with the stars. From the code, we get factual, mathematically provable evidence that all ancient sites, megaliths, temples, stone circles, effigies, and certain natural formations and vortexes across the entire face of the, I'm going to say world, not globe, are very precisely located on a coordinate system in relation to the Great Pyramid. So all of these places are connected. And I would love to figure out if this area at Skinwalker Ranch would also be included in this. Um, and it says here, when the author of the above referenced article tried to attain permission to explore some of the caves near Isis Temple to substantiate claims of Egyptian relics there, he was emphatically denied. The Park Service, so the Isis Temple is at the Grand Canyon, the Park Service apparently citing endangered bats as a reason that they have completely restricted access to these areas. Because, of course, that's what happens every time, isn't it? So when it comes to the question of who built these things that are connected to these portals, we have the book of Enoch 8.2, which says that the fallen angels taught astrology, the constellations, the knowledge of clouds, the signs of the earth, the signs of the sun, and the course of the moon. And again, from Steve Quayle's book, it says, with that in mind, we could postulate that in, that in addition to being a naturally formed gorge, the Grand Canyon could have been a prehistoric city where fallen angels technology was employed. So in essence, um, the Great Pyramid and the other structures like it, or at least connected to it, they might not look like the Great Pyramid. They could be, you know, these, these dolmens, they could be these fairy forts, they could be these megalithic structures, but they are all in alignment with the Great Pyramid and they all have connections to these portals. And um, uh, now Steve Quayle, he does call them stargates. And I prefer to think of them as the, the portals as being either interdimensional or if you think of the earth as being a puddle in a vast plain, we could also think of these portals as going between the puddles. So Quayle goes on to say, a closer examination of the purpose for the Great Pyramid indicates that, as it says in Isaiah 19, verses 19 to 20, it was built as a testament to the Lord God Most High. It could have only been constructed with pre-Adamic angelic efforts but not a simple signpost. Rather, it appears to be the engine for a gate or doorway to points off world. There are other structures around the world that have the same reputation for being gateways or doorways. So we always look at ancient Egypt and a lot of times we'll look at, you know, the pyramids in, in Cancun, but they're all over the world. And these other structures around the world, again, they're known for being doorways to a parallel world or um, just demarcation points. And as Steve Quayle would say, interstellar travel, I would say interdimensional travel. But let's just take a look at a few of these. We have the Gate of the Gods in Hayu Marca, Peru. The Place of the Gods in in Abu Ghraib, Egypt. We have Stonehenge, which I know has some questionable history because we know that it has been moved around a bit. They say that it was for maintenance and we know that there have been reinforcements placed in it. And again, they say that it was for maintenance, but we do have photographs, not photographs, um, drawings and illustrations of Stonehenge that are several hundred years old that do have it looking like this, although some will say that it was moved from another site. But we're just going to include it in this just because. And these are also good examples of the dolmens, um, which are the larger stones with another flatter stone across the top. And those, again, associated with portals. So here we have the ancient Sumerian Stargate, and you're probably asking, well, where is this? Well, this is the Euphrates River, and this is what it looks like right now. And yes, it is drying up. And Steve Quayle says, in the book of Revelation, we are told that the Euphrates River dries up and the bottomless pit is opened. So this is considered to be also 
a stargate. Um, and it does say, many have speculated over the years that an ancient stargate does in fact sit at the bottom of the Euphrates and will once again become active at the end of the age. This is the Gate of the Sun in Tiahuanaco, Bolivia. Um, and it's, it's made from one block of stone. So, yeah, that's interesting. I'd like to see how that was done. This is the Ran Masu Oyana Stargate in Sri Lanka. I might be pronouncing some of these words wrong, but I am going to do my best. This is from Abydos, Egypt. I probably said that extremely wrong, but so Abydos, Egypt, the, the most interesting thing about Abydos, Egypt is not only the fact that it's thought to be an area of a, of a gateway, but it's the hieroglyphics that can be found there, which clearly look like modern technology drawn into the hieroglyphs. You know, it looks like a helicopter here. Um, I don't know. I always said this one looks like a, like a Cadillac from the 1950s. Um, this looks like what we might call a UFO and lots of questions, but this is certainly very interesting. And I know that most people have seen this at one point in time, but most people do not know that the area itself is considered to be a Stargate. And here we have Gobek Gobekli Tepe in Turkey. And it's known as the oldest stone temple in the world. And it is also, um, it has a reputation for also being some sort of portal or stargate. This is Mount Olympus. And although that is thought to be legendary, I am going to include that here because Steve Quayle had some very interesting things to say about that. And again, I'm going to read from his book, and it says, The Greek pantheon lived high up in the sky, or so we tend to think, on a mythical mountain called Olympus. But was this an imaginary mountain or a very real historical one? Zeus and his fellow Olympians became rulers of the earth after a massive worldwide smackdown called the Titanomachy. I know I said that wrong. According to legends, there have been several monarchies amongst the small G-gods since Genesis 6, um, and perhaps even at least one prior to that, if indeed theories held by some, which we do not have time or space in this chapter to peruse, regarding a previous creation that preceded the one in Genesis. The first generation of divine rulers are often called the, primori the primordial lowercase g-gods. Chaos, Gaia, Tartarus, Eros, Erebus, and Nyx. These gave rise to the Titans, the 12 children of Chaos and Gaia, sometimes listed as Uranus or Uranus and Gaia, i.e. sky and earth. These 12 were giants and they lived on Mount Othrys. Kronos led those 12 Titans, planning their stratagems from their bunker atop Mount Othrys. So we have these ancient ruins on ley lines all over the world on every continent. And again, I'm questioning whether the ones on Skinwalker Ranch um, would be connected to these ley lines as well. Just a theory that I have. So in addition to all of these megalithic structures all over the world, there are also pyramids all over the world. And again, we're, we always seem to focus on Egypt and Mexico, but they're all over the world. So this one is from China. And I mean, it's, it's not the only one. It's just, this is just one of them from China. And then here we have Mexico, which we do hear of all the time. And of course we have Egypt and there's no need even to look at that because it's like emblazoned in our brains from seeing those so much. This is from Turkey, Indonesia. This is from France. <laughs> Take a wild guess why it's an old photo of that. This is from the Canary Islands. This is in Italy. And yes, even in the United States which as you can see is overgrown with vegetation, but that's how most of them do tend to look. 
especially in areas where they don't want to admit that they exist in the first place. But as you can see, there are even steps going up this. I would actually love to travel there and just walk across this and study it sometime. So continuing on in Steve Quayle's book, it says there are ancient ruins on ley lines on every continent, which we just covered. They are at the top of mountains, at the bottom of oceans, in valleys, and on plains alike. The commonality among these structures are stones honed to a degree of precision beyond the capabilities of the ancient peoples of those areas. So again, who built them? Blocks and stones have been moved and set in such a way that even with our modern machinery, this kind of precise work would be extremely difficult for us to accomplish. Many of these structures feature ancient dolmens, and that's what this is here. Two large stones with a flat stone laid across the top. There are even dolmens like these. Whoops, what did I just do? There are even dolmens like these in North and South Korea, which I will share a photo with with you later on one of those. Anyway, another item seen through the sites is some sort of rendition of a sphinx. So they're half human and half animal, and this is the one that you probably see. This is the great sphinx of Egypt. And again, Egypt is always just really pushed on us more than anything else. So this is the one that we tend to think of as the sphinx, but there are sphinxes all over the world. And most of the time, most sphinxes do have wings. So it says, when you couple these figures with the numerous findings of half bird, half man statues and drawings, it makes one wonder what it is these people were trying to communicate. Is it the fact that these beings flew into this time and space, but they were bipods? Or is it more likely that angels have wings and the people of the day saw them, but didn't know how to describe them? So was it beings like this? that were um, building these, these portals. Now, one thing that I do want to point out is that the book of Revelation talks about the living beings. And that could also be something that we could think about. So we are told that these living with these living beings, there is one with the head of a lion and one with the head of a bull one with the head of a man and one with the head of a an eagle and so you have to think you know it is thought that the watchers were seraphim and it is thought that these are also seraphim so the the fallen angels that came down to earth and were possibly sharing this technology could very well have had animalistic characteristics, which could be why they were building these sphinxes, because again, this is what they were seeing. Now, this is actually from Skinwalker Ranch, and I know that it doesn't look like much looking at it now, but every time that I watch that show and it shows this, I think to myself, it looks like a sphinx or at least it looks like what was once a sphinx. And again, if we're in an area where something catastrophic happened and nothing major really stood standing, is it possible that this could also have once been a sphinx? I don't know, but that's just the impression that I get every time that I see it. So all of these gates that I have been showing you, they normally would fit on top of a pyramid. So again, I'm thinking of this little ring that this little circle that is on top of this is Skimwalker Ranch again, that is on the mesa here. And I'm thinking if this was once a pyramid, could that stone circle have once been a bit more intricate? And that's what's left over. I also have to say that um, the word pyramid actually means fiery mound. And so Skinwalker Ranch, the, the ridge here, it has been known for lighting up just for no apparent reason, just lighting up at night. You just see flashes of light coming off of it at night. And to me, that just, it just reminds me of what the word pyramid means. It means fiery mound. Now, since we have been talking about fairy forts, and I will sometime in the future be doing another video on fairy rings. I was going to include them in this video, but I already had way too much information. But I did want to share something very interesting that I found out about 
fairies from Gary Wayne's book, The Genesis 6 Conspiracy. And first of all, what we need to realize is that the fairies are Nephilim, and they're not necessarily what we think of as being fairies. You know, a lot of times just folk tales kind of mix in with that. But I found the origin of the word fairies very interesting because it describes the appearance of what real fairies looked like. So it says in Celtic mythology, exclusive royal families, and I have to point out, and this is like going on a tangent, but since we're talking about fairies, I had to share this. So the royal families are, are all thought to have Nephilim blood. And so in Celtic mythology, exclusive royal families carried what is renowned in Grail lore as fairy blood. Romans viewed the Celts as a tall and fair-skinned people. While fairies in Wales were called, I'm going to butcher this, Tilwith Tag, the fair family. So Tilwith Tag is in fact the Welsh translation for fairy. According to Gardner, fairy blood, the, blood, the bloodlines of fairies, those of the lineage of fair folk. So the word fairy actually is describing the appearance of, of this group of people as being they're very fair. So I just found that interesting that the word fairies came from an actual description of what they looked like. And here's another dolmen that, again, they are associated with fairies, but this dolmen is actually from North Korea. And so going back to Quail's book, it says there are virtually tens of thousands of these Neolithic dolmens spread across the world with 30,000 in North and South Korea alone. 30,000, my friends. This isn't just some European anomaly. If these structures are actually, quote, stargates that are powered by the energy on the ley lines where they have been built, could it be that gating was more prevail prevalent than even this author previously thought? Although we talk about advanced angelic technology, could this means of travel have been as common to ancient angelic civilizations as our civilization's passengers getting on an airplane? And if you think about it, the fact that they are so widespread, there are so many of them, this is something that was common. It was commonly used. It was commonly known. And these portals were commonly being made. I know a lot of times when we look at hieroglyphs, and I know that Scott Walter has done this already, when he talks about archaeoastronomy, he sees these spirals that are carved into stones, and he says, oh, this is signifying stars. And no, I don't think that's what those spirals are. They're portals, because that's what these people were seeing, because this was common in that time. So he says, as previously stated, these stargates are all around the world. Of particular interest are the gates at Mount Moriah, and this is the top of Mount Moriah, and Mount Hermon. And this is Mount Hermon, the infamous Mount Hermon. And they are ancient gates, to be sure. There were also important reports of a stargate found in Iraq just at the beginning of the 2003 war. Likewise, a swirling vortex off the coast of Yemen in the Sea of Aden was centered around a gate. The point is that stargates are real, powered by fallen angel technology, and in use by the world's governments today. Um, yeah, I just am thinking of CERN. I know CERN isn't the only one, but that is certainly one for sure. These ancient structures were built by beings in a pre-Adamic age, and many of them are still in operation. It, it could have been in a pre-Adamic age, like he says, but I'm also thinking that that's still kind of iffy to me. It also could have been built. They could have been living here simultaneously with these civilizations, especially if you consider that the Watchers did descend down on this very mountain. They were here simultaneously with people. They were sharing their technology. And considering that these people were, you know, making things like sphinxes that look very much like the living beings that are described in the book of Revelation, um, it, it doesn't necessarily just have to be um, a pre-Adamic time period that this happened in. So actually another name for these mountains, like we're speaking of right now, such as Mount Moriah, Mount Hermon. And yes, I would even say, obviously this is not the real place, but the, the Garden of Eden is thought to have been on a mountain and these are called cosmic mountains. 
So a lot of you might be thinking to yourself, well, I never thought of the Garden of Eden as being on a mountain, but that certainly does seem to be what is represented in the descriptions of it, which we'll get to the, the point of the Axis Mundi in a little bit. But I just wanted to, again, share um, Steve Quayle's book. And again, I, I know I've just been digging into these books all day long. There's so much good information in these books. I really, really recommend that you go and get them for yourselves because I could probably make an entire series just based on one of these books, let alone I've got three of them that I'm using today. Um, but it says, think of this original and eternal divine mountain as the creator God's meeting, meeting place or throne room. We have a beautiful description of this meeting place in Revelation 4, where the apostle John is taken up into the throne room to see the risen Christ and views what appears to be the first meeting of the divine council after the restoration of mankind to membership. And if you actually do read in Revelation 4, there are many parts of that passage that sound like it is referring to a portal. So, for example, John says that he, he looks and beholds a door was opened in heaven, and that might be called a portal opening. Um, and then uh, and then he goes on to say that he was in the spirit and Steve Quayle makes the point that maybe one cannot enter this extra dimensional realm in the flesh. Um, it goes on to talk about the gemstones and the description of it, but especially the part about the Axis Monday, which is not in, in the book of Revelation, that that specifically is is what leads us to believe that it, it could very well have been on a mountain and that actually could be the significance of the high places that are often spoken of in the bible which are not necessarily a good thing one example is second kings fifteen four, where it says nevertheless the high places were not taken away the people still sacrificed and made offerings on the high places so it is very possible that these people were still associating high places such as the, the, the mountain of the creator God, the Garden of Eden, um, the high places as Mount Hermon, where these watchers descended. They were associating all of these places with high places. So they were trying to basically imitate what the quote gods were doing. Timothy Alberino in his book Birthright says, at first glance, Cosmic Mountain cosmology presents a contradiction. Do the gods dwell on earth or in heaven? The nuance of the answer, which has eluded the grasp of secular anthropologists and biblical scholars alike, has always been comprehended by, adep by adepts of the occult. The gods dwell in heaven, but their abode is mystically conjoined to the earth at specific points of contact. The ancient sages believed that magical gates facilitated access to and from the immortal realms of their deities. Naturally, primitive cultures assumed that these gates must be located on the highest geographical positions of the landscape surrounding their domiciles, closest to the heavens. The superstitious practice of seeking intercourse with the divine by way of the high places is the residue of a reality known to the progenitors of our race who fellowshiped with their elder siblings, the gods, the lowercase g gods, in the Garden of Eden, the gate to which was likely located on Mount Hermon. And again, I'm going to point out that this is not lowercase g gods as in polytheistic religion. Lowercase g gods is simply referring to the Elohim, the created heavenly beings that we do not worship, that the people in these high places started worshiping and they were not supposed to, but they are not gods, they are created beings, but that is just, um, it's, it's a way that they're named. Um, yeah, I, I actually don't even like calling them that, but that's what they're called. Alberino also says that the metaphysical convergence of multiple realms at the center of the cosmos is known as the axis mundi or cosmic axis, commonly portrayed in the form of a world tree. And this is the world tree from Norse mythology, um, Yggdrasil. I might've said it wrong, but this is that world tree. 
um, with its branches reaching into the heavens, its trunk fixed on the earth, and its roots sticking into the underworld, often with the branches and roots connected in a circular configuration. The axis mundi functions as a crossroads between worlds, the axis of creation where the four cardinal directions come together or diverge, sometimes represented in the merging or dividing of the four of four rivers. Eden is described as the fountainhead of four rivers that flowed down through the surrounding provinces, a clear indication of its elevated position in the landscape. So the Garden of Eden is thought to be on the top of a mountain because the rivers are flowing downwards. And again, so we have the, the four rivers and we're thinking of the Axis Mundi. But there is another way to actually look at the Garden of Eden. And this is what I think of when I think of the four rivers converging um, into the Garden of Eden. This is a map of the North Pole from the year 1606. I actually have this map on my living room wall. And the North Pole is actually thought by a great many people to be the actual location of the Garden of Eden, because we all know that our timeline has been messed up. Some of the history, like geography, has is not specifically where we think that it was. And so if we look at this 1606 map of the North Pole, we do see this is Sometimes it is believed to be a magnetic rock. Other times it is thought to be an actual mountain in the middle of the North Pole. And then we see these four rivers converging. And to me, this is the perfect illustration of the Axis Mundi. So some other examples of these cosmic mountains are Mount Maru of South Asian cosmology, the Harabarazeti of Iranian tradition and Himimbjorg of Scandinavian mythology. There's also, I'm going to butcher this, Yatschi from, from the Mayans. Um, and then we have the Lenape Indians and other Eastern woodland people. It says the center post of their ceremonial cult house supports the sky and passes into the very hand of the celestial deity. So again, that could also be representing the Axis Mundi. So this idea of there being some sort of portal that conjoins all of the realms is innate in so many cultures, probably in every culture, because it is something that has been more or less ingrained in us through our, what some people might call ancestral memories. I don't know, is that just a term that I just made up? But it's something that we collectively just know. And there are many things like that. Um, a lot of people believe that just with the, the whole history of the, the worldwide flood is that it's a history that's, that sometimes people just innately know within them happened. And this is the case also with these portals that seem to be connecting all of these different realms. And yeah, it's not just one area where these, these portals are. They are all over the world. And yes, I would say that a good portion of them are still active if you have the knowledge for how to use them. Albrino also brought up the book, The Magician's Nephew, which so many people have recommended that I read this book. And I really need to because you know what? I have not read this book, but it seems like it would be right up my alley. But he says, C.S. Lewis provides us with a creative illustration of the concept of the Axis Mundi in the Chronicles of Narnia. Um, fans of the series will recall the wood between the worlds featured in chapter three of The Magician's Nephew. The wood between the worlds was a serene in-between place that served as a terminal to multiple worlds, accessible through pools of water distributed over the forest floor. The pools functioned like portals. When Diggory and Polly, the young protagonists in the story, jumped into a particular pool, they were instantly transported to the world with which it was communicated. The wood itself was not a world, but a crossroads between the worlds, the Axis Mundi.
Perhaps unbeknownst to Lewis, the medium he imagined as the tether that binds the worlds to the wood, namely pools of water, is remarkably harmonious with the Mesopotamian view of Mount Hermon and the confluence of cosmic waters where heaven, earth, and the underworld converged. Now, he said, perhaps unbeknownst to Lewis, but from something that I actually learned in a Blurry Creatures podcast that I listened to the other day where they interviewed Gary Wayne, is that C.S. Lewis very likely had insider knowledge on all of these um, issues, such as the, the creatures that he writes about, even these these portals in the puddles. He knew something because apparently... He was trained as an adept. He was given a lot of hidden knowledge, and so was um, Tolkien, the author of Lord of the Rings. And where they learned this knowledge was actually it had ties to Rosicrucians who had ties to Freemasons, which makes you wonder a little bit about the intentions of C.S. Lewis. I don't know. I don't know if he like did become a true believer or if he just... I hope he did. But anyway, um, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't read his books because I still think that they're very insightful. In fact, even more so knowing that he was trained in this sort of esoteric knowledge. And I actually do have something to share about that. Just something very quickly. So this is just from another, I think this was another podcast where they interviewed Gary Wayne. So underneath the veil of Narnia and Hobbiton with Gary Wayne, so I'll leave a link in the description box to this podcast if you wanted to listen to it. I just wanted to share with you, and this is not the one that I listened to, by the way. The one that I listened to is Blurry Creatures, but I'm using this just because of the summary that it has written here. It says, in this episode, Carl Crew is joined by Gary Wayne. And again, he is the author of Genesis 6 Conspiracy. Follow us as we dive into the history of secret writing societies that date back millennia and continue even up to this present day. Covering a subject close to the hearts of millions of fantasy readers regarding C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien and their masterful works, we uncover their allegiance to a Rosicrucian secret society they were born into, into through their hidden family lineage. So they were born into this. The Inklings were a group of writers from Oxford who met at a local pub. They conspired to write stories that are fantastically entertaining with an understructure visible only to adepts of these esoteric initiates. They craftily infused doubt and deception into their underpinning storylines that moved people away from what is real into their false pagan narrative. Lineage and bloodlines of fairies, dwarves, and the Nephilim all play heavily into this deceit. Having practically grown up with the Chronicles of Narnia and feasting off the Lord of the Rings throughout my youth, it is with much sadness and fascination that we separate truth from fiction. So, yes. So, Timothy Alberino's question of whether he unknowingly just kind of picked up on this. No, I, he, he definitely knew what he was sharing about these, these puddles. Something else that likely happened on the top of Mount Hermon, again, an Axis Mundi, was the Transfiguration of Christ. And Timothy Alberino says it was an event which most certainly transpired on Hermon. And it's a preview of the Axis Mundi in operation. Upon ascending the cosmic mountain, Jesus is met by Moses, who had died and descended to Abraham's bosom in the underworld, and by Elijah, who had not died, but ascended into heaven aboard a fiery chariot. Jesus, Moses, and Elijah represent the convergence of three realms. The first, the land of the living. The second, the abode of the dead. And the third, the paradise of heaven. So again, we've got these three realms coming together on the top of Mount Hermon during the transfiguration. He goes on to say, It is not by happenstance that the watchers arrived from an extraterrestrial realm and again, by extraterrestrial, when I say it, now I'm sure Alberino means something different, but when I'm thinking extraterrestrial, I'm thinking of extra land, an extra realm, something that is not from this realm that we are on right here. But the watchers arrived from an extraterrestrial realm on the summit of Mount Hermon, so right here, 
before going down into the plains to despoil our women and defile our race. Nor is it coincidental that Christ, while standing in front of a cave called the Gates of Hades, at the base of the same mountain near Caesarea Philippi, declared to his disciples that the gates of hell would not prevail against his church. So it was at the foot of this mountain where he said that, that the gates of hell would not prevail against his church. The gates. It is evident that the Hebrews, like the Sumerians, Akkadians, Babylonians, and Canaanites before them, believed there was a stargate on the cosmic mountain of Hermon. Just to go off on another tangent, I find it very interesting that hell in Norse mythology is a giantess and or a goddess who rules over the identically named hell, the underworld where many of the dead dwell. Her name's meaning of hidden surely has to do with the underworld and the dead being hidden or buried beneath the ground. So there are so many threads commonalities between different cultures and that's why we know that there is an underlying truth underneath underlying truth underneath that's great english but there's an underlying truth there beneath these and so what we need to do in this day and age is we need to try to pull forth what seems to be the truth and that's why at this point in time i i always say this here and i'm going to say it again is that the word of God is truth. And what it seems that a lot of these other cultures are doing is that they have a lot of the same memories, but they have different takes on it. And unfortunately, their takes are, are a bit twisted and they still contain a parcel of truth in them. And that is really a testament to the accuracy and to the fact that these, these portals these cosmic mountains, um, the, the flood, all of these epic tales that we learned about, you know, in Sunday school class, they, they definitely happened. And it's something that different cultures will, will um, attest to that just with their own twist on these things. So yeah, so these portals are gateways to other realms. They are real. They are all over the world. I would say that a lot of them are still working. And I would say that there are, well, there's definitely a gateway to the he heavenly realm. There's a gateway to the demonic realm. And I would also say that it's very possible that there are gateways to other realms that are unknown to us. Um, and I just think it's interesting to look into and going back to Skinwalker Ranch, I can't help but wonder if my theory about what's going on there could be connected to the rest of these portals around the world. That's all that I have for you today. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed yet and would like to hear more of what I have to say, I would love if you would do that. If you have any questions or comments, you can leave one either here or over on Instagram. And if you like my work and would like to check out my Patreon page, I will leave a link in the description box for that as well. And I hope you have a great day.